This is Sandy Wadworth. And this is Dusty Wadworth. Today we have a special presentation for you. This is uh, very good news that will bless many. Yes, so this is a presentation we've been wanting to give for a long time. You know, but Dusty, we couldn't give the presentation until we achieved a certain level of success. Correct. Uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Okay. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we ask that you help us make this presentation in a matter that pleases you. We pray that this presentation reaches the ears and eyes of those that you want to learn about our discoveries. We pray that this presentation does what you desire to be done. Amen. Amen. I want to talk about a major discovery of gold that was made in Alabama, Dusty. Yes, so this started with a Bible study and a special word from God. This discovery is so major, it will start in Alabama gold rush. Yes, sir. And I know that's a bold statement, but I'm going to make a bolder one. A gold rush so substantial that Alabama's top industry becomes gold mining, whereas Alabama becomes the world's foremost producer of gold. It was a shocking discovery. It was made, a, made with the use of cutting-edge technology. Yes, there's many people, property owners in Alabama, that are sitting on a sea of gold, and they're unaware of it. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to tell them about it. Now, first, let's lay the groundwork for this presentation, and we want to consider some past history. Okay. You know, unknown to most and we, we've dealt with a lot of geologists and mining engineers and metallurgists. Correct. And uh, they don't understand, but Alabama's already had its first gold rush. Correct. And actually, gold mining was a top industry in the state. Yes. This rush dated back to 1830. Uh, actually, because of the rush, two of the biggest towns in Alabama were gold mining towns. And one of them was named Artabahichi, and I hope I pronounced that right. Another one, Goldville. This gold rush ended when greener grass was promised Alabama's miners with the discovery of California gold in 1849. That Alabama miners were told in California that the nuggets were big, you could just pick them off the ground, and anybody that could pan could be rich overnight. You know, with the news, Alabama's two biggest towns, the gold mining towns, became ghost towns overnight. And actually, in Goldville, there's a monument that tells about this event. It's important to know that these uh, miners, they didn't leave because the gold ran out. They left because of greener grass. Dusty, that's a good point. You know, Alabama's first state geologist, a man named Michael Toomey, uh, he did a review of Alabama's gold fields, and he agreed with that point. Yes. And on January the 3rd, 1855, Toomey published her, his report in the Montgomery Advertiser. Now, he said something pretty important at the conclusion yes, of his article. He said, when capital directed by science and skill is invested into the minds of the state, it's not too much to say that the results must, he used the word must, Amen. be profit to the stockholder and advantage to the country. That's a powerful statement. Yeah. You know, but 37 years later, Another man entered the scene. He was a professor of chemistry and metallurgist, and he worked with the University of Alabama. He conducted a study for the Geological Survey of Alabama. Uh, this man's name was Dr. William Battle Phillips. Now, he was a well-known individual. He was well-respected in his field. And later, he played a major part in Texas oil boom and went on to become the president of the Colorado School of Mines, which is... Uh, a really impressive school. Yeah. But in 1892, uh, Phillips completed his study for the state. A study was done on an area called Alabama's Gold District, a part of that district. Uh, he rewrote up a report. It became bulletin number three of the Geological Survey of Alabama. The report was titled A Preliminary Report on a Part of the Lower gold belt of Alabama in the counties of Chilton, Coosa, and Tallapoosa. With this study, Phillips visited many prospecting sites and abandoned gold mine sites. Now, he was a metallurgist and a chemist, and he conducted assays, and he performed metallurgical tests where he extracted gold from the ores, all with the use of 1890 technology. His work was very impressive. 
He had a powerful conclusion to that report, uh, more powerful than what Toomey said. Yes, sir, he did. Here's what he said, quote, No notice has been taken of what I sincerely believe could be developed into one of the most successful enterprises in the state, gold mining, end quote. That's a powerful conclusion to an impressive study. Phillips was a professional. He did very good work. And his work did convince him that uh, Alabama's gold mining could become one of the most successful enterprises in the state. But um, he was also conflicted. He was of the opinion that gold mining would greatly benefit a few Alabamians financially. But developing Alabama's coal and iron ore would put much of the state to work, much more of the state. He expressed that opinion in bulletin number three. He also suggested to the governor that the state should promote and develop the coal and iron ore instead of promoting and developing its gold deposits. Uh, the governor did take his advice. Uh, soon after that, bulletin number three was forgot and was buried in the Alabama's archives until we dug it out in 2009. Now, Dusty, I want to change gears here. And I want to bring out a, a major and very important point. The type of gold that started Alabama's first gold rush is what is known as free gold. Uh, some might call it simple gold. This is gold that could be detected with that day's technology and harvested with crude processes. It shows up when uh, a, in a test pan and it can be easily seen with the naked eye. Free gold was a type of gold studied by Phillips and Toomey. It can be easily detected with standard fire assays. Correct. And it can be harvested with um, the various type of gold plants on the market today. Correct. Now, in 2004, we were part of a team and we made a major discovery. Yes, sir. And it was a second form of gold called complex gold. Correct. What shocked everybody was the magnitude of this discovery. Yeah. Dusty, in your experience, and you've looked at a lot of Alabama properties, uh, I think it, we assayed uh, about 107 properties that show positive uh, complex gold. Correct. How much more complex gold is there in Alabama's oil body than there is free gold? In my experience, it's about 50 times more. It's a lot. That is a lot. Yeah. So, if a gold rush could be could be taking place in Alabama today, based on the harvest of free, free gold, gold, when you add complex gold to the picture, <laughs> that's when Alabama becomes the world's foremost producer of gold. Correct. If you remember, our 2004 discovery started with the 2003 Bible study, Danny. I remember it very well. We were on our ranch, and I was near the paved road doing something when our uncle passed by, and he stopped to visit. And the conversation turned to be about the Word of God and the subject of wisdom. Dusty, you remember my commercial? Yes, sir. It went something like this. From my study of the Word of God, I've learned that he would tell you practical things. God will even tell you where the gold and silver is located. Now, that seems funny today, but at the time, we were not miners. No, sir. We had no vision of becoming miners. No, uh, it, just was, it was just a commercial, and it was what I came up with to interest my fellow Christians in a Bible study. But God had some other things on his mind. Well, on that day, my commercial worked. Uh, my uncle wanted to have a Bible study. He really desired to learn how to hear the voice of the Lord more clearly. He invited us for a sit-down Bible study. After the study, you remember him getting out the maps and the data he had on a, on a mining project he was working <clears throat> on. He was very interested in that project, and he wanted to hear the voice of the Lord concerning that project. A little later on, I was cutting my grass on our ranch, and um, I liked to when I cut my grass, pray in fellowship with God. Mm -hmm. On this particular day, I heard these words, 
Go tell your uncle that the land he's working on is loaded with minerals, but it's going to take faith to get them out of the ground. And when I heard that, I spoke and I said this, Lord, I'm not going to tell my uncle this, for he'll think I'm crazy. And the Lord, uh, he said, uh, I heard the Lord, he said, what's the subject of your Bible study? And I said, oh, how to hear the voice of the Lord. Realizing that this was the Lord and risking embarrassment, I stopped my mower and I went to my uncle's house immediately and I told him what the Lord said. Let's fast forward now to the spring of 2004. One morning, my uncle comes knocking on our door and says, Sandy, I can't get the words that you told me out of my mind. Will you and Dusty help me with the exploration work on this mine site? He wanted us to help him look for the minerals. Mike and tell him. Your mother, Dina, was the cause of us considering the project. Uh, if you remember, just before my uncle came in, Dina told us that she'd been praying all night about some mineral rights that we gave away. She was telling the Lord that we were due a harvest from that gift. When your mother targeted the subject, any subject in prayer, we paid attention. Yes, sir. Because she got results. She had Amen. a direct line to God. Amen. Remember one time, out of the blue, she decided we needed to produce an oil well <laughs> from some mineral rights she inherited. And uh, she prayed one in. Amen. It was a major producer, Amen. too. Amen. It brought some nice income in. Praise God. So we gladly took this exploration project, and we assigned the number to this job, uh, Project 111. Our objective, again, was to test drill parts of that project to locate the minerals mica and tannin. We did successfully locate an abundance of mica and a small amount of tannin. We gathered samples from our test holes. Dusty, what happened next? Bob Drake of Woodruff, Oklahoma, entered the picture. Dusty Bob was a good guy. Yes, sir. Uh, he was the first mining metallurgical consultant that we used on Project 111. A large composite sample was sent to him of the mineral deposit. Uh, what was the name of his firm? International Separation Technology. And Bob was to review that sample, perform some tests within his lab, and give his opinion as to the best process to harvest the minerals. Well, Bob was looking at an ore sample under a microscope, and he made a major discovery. He saw the existence of some very fine gold, but this gold was locked in the small grains of quartz. He was impressed at the quantity of gold he saw, but this was not free gold, it was complex gold. The good news was this gold could be seen, and if so, there had to be a way to harvest it. He prepared a sample for us and sent it off to an assaying lab to have his opinion verified. But he didn't use just any assay lab. He used one called Advanced Analytical LLC. The founder of that lab was a Dr. E. Jordan. He was a pioneer in the metallurgical world. Yeah. He, he did some very impressive work for Phelps Dodge major mining company. He was able to locate platinum and he was able to provide them with processes to harvest the platinum. Yep. And what was unique about that, they were harvesting platinum where the city was no platinum. Where the experts said it couldn't exist. Correct. At the time we became involved with Advanced Analytical, Dr. Donald E. Jordan had passed away. And the company had been passed down to his daughter and her husband, Gary and Kathleen Smith. So our dealings were with the Smiths, and they became a big part of our dealings. We did a lot of work for us. Yes, sir. Spent a lot of money with that firm over the years. My uncle, he wanted a second opinion. And so he took eight samples on his own without anybody knowing about it, and he took that to of all places, Alabama Power Company Laboratory. <laughs> now, I didn't know they had a laboratory, but they did, and they provided services to their customers for a fee. Yep. So this lab also used modern technology. Yes, sir. It was very much different than what was used by Advanced Analytical. We got results back 
from Alabama Power Company quicker than we did Advanced Analytical. Now, there were eight samples sent to them. All eight came back positive for gold. Yes, sir. Now, when we looked at percent by weight and saw that, we didn't know how to calculate it. We didn't know what that meant. And so, we at the time, we didn't even know... If it was good or not good. Or we just didn't understand. Uh, yeah. But now we have the skills to to reduce that ounce per ton. Test number one, 7.39 ounce per ton go. Wow. 6.11 ounce per ton go for number two. Three, 5.14 ounce per ton go. Four, seven point. 39 ounce per ton gold. Five, 4.82 ounce per ton gold. Six, 6.11 ounce per ton gold. Seven, 6.75 ounce per ton gold. And eight was done in the creek. And it came back 14.47 ounce per ton gold. Wow. That's what shocked them. Yeah. They were not the only ones shocked on that same day. We had a meeting scheduled with a geologist and a metallurgist. And we showed them the XRF assays. And they didn't say a word about that gold. <laughs> uh, they just kind of looked funny and started talking about the mica. If you remember, I spoke up and said, gentlemen, something's not right. Y'all acting like this is a first date. It's kind of uncomfortable. <laughs> so what is the problem? I mean... Is the problem, in your opinion, the assays are too good to be true? Yes. <laughs> they both spoke up at the same time. They said, yes, those reports can't be true. And I said, gentlemen, you're going to have to rethink that position because my wife's been praying about this project, and when she prays, something's up. <laughs> now, we had a meeting later with the, with the uh, mining engineer, and at that meeting... We were talking to him about the value of the project because we were considering purchasing the project. My uncle wanted to sell the project to us for $10 million. <laughs> now, we didn't have $10 million, but we had some assets, and we did have the ability to raise the money. The point of the meeting was, is this project worth $10 million? So the mining engineer he started said, yes, but it's going to take a long time to get out that mica. And he kept talking about Micah, 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 Micah. And I said, hey, man, what about the gold? Boom. He slammed his hand down on the table hard and to get my attention. And then he said, Sandy, if those assays are report, then you just discovered the largest gold mine in the world. Amen. At that point, Dusty, it's funny. But I was shocked. And I said, excuse me a few minutes. I got to go to the bathroom. No, I went with you. <laughs> well, I didn't know you went with me. <laughs> I walked in the door to the bathroom and I said, Lord, what am I going to do with that? And the, the, you were right behind me. Now, we might take some heat for adding the Lord so much in this presentation. <laughs> I notice a lot of times you'll say praise the Lord and in your comments and amen and stuff like that. But the Lord is very much a part of our business. Amen. And in truth, there is no presentation to give today without no, sir. what he taught us and showed us, without the wisdom that he provided us. He really did show us where the gold and where the silver was located. Amen. After this, a few weeks later, Vance and Lilico came up with their assays. And it showed 3.4 ounce per ton gold, 12.43 ounce per ton silver, and 5.42 ounce per ton platinum. And it also showed other precious metals in, as well. From there, Dusty, we visited Bob Drake. Yes. One of the things we wanted to know from Mr. Drake, we wanted to know, is this project worth $10 million? What do you say? It's worth every bit of it. But only if you have a process to harvest that gold out of the north. Correct. 
Now he was sure a process could be attained. He said it's not going to be no problem. We will obtain the process. But he also said it could take up to 10 years to do that. Yes. It was going to involve some serious work. So then he, he passed on a little bit more advice. He said, why don't y'all look for your own property? Of course, our opinion was, well, this is one that got the gold on it. He said, Sandy, the way that ore body is, if there's gold on that property, there's gold on other properties like it. Yes, sir. Because of the mineral makeup. And he said, if y'all go and prospect, you can locate your own property, and you won't have to spend $10 million for your property. Amen. Well, we took his advice, and we involved a lot of professionals over the years, how many properties do we locate in Alabama? 109. And all 109 of those properties tested positive for, for complex gold. gold. Yep. A lot of them had free gold on it too, but they tested positive for a complex gold. We, what we had for proof that the gold was there was high-tech assays. Uh, it was what Bob saw under the microscope. And it was a word given by the Lord. Now, we needed some metal in hand to produce, pr prove our work. Correct. I remember one time, I think you were there, Daddy was telling me, he said, you know, son, I'm going to believe your reports about gold if you would just do one thing. If you just can take a small sample and put it through a process and put some metal and put it in my hand. Yeah, I remember that. Well, he was right, though. That's what needed to be done next. Dad, since then, uh, we produced a lot of melon hand, from complex ores to simple ores. In our laboratory, we produced gold and silver beads, and in our pipe plant, we produced nice little bars of gold. Now, let me ask you a question. Of the mining projects that we worked on, how many of those projects have we successfully harvested gold from either a lab process or a pilot plant setup? You know, Dad, I, I don't know that number. After 160 projects, I quit counting, but I know it's more than 160 projects. We produced metal in hand from Alabama ores, from one Montana project I remember working on, yes, and Mexico ores. The very first time we produced gold from a complex ore was in Alabama, and it was on a project we called the Rosa Project. Dusty is one thing to locate a complex ore body, but it's another thing altogether to harvest gold and other precious metals from an ore body like that. Yes, sir. That takes a lot of work and takes a lot of time. Yes, sir. Okay, let's talk about the Rosa Project. Okay. With the help of some very good consultants, we did some prospecting work, and over a period of time, we located, you said, 109 Alabama sites. Yes, sir. Those sites had complex gold on them. Correct. And this was a major accomplishment. It took us a while to do. Yes. From that, we decided that we liked two of these sites the best, and one of these sites was the Rosa Project. Correct. Now, we call this the Rosa Project because the mineral rights are owned by a Steve and Susan Roser. What made us like the Rosa Project? Uh, we liked the ore, and it had a really cool gold mine on it. <laughs> and that gold mine was from the 1800s. 1800s. Yes, sir. Now, we made a contract to mine this property under the company name 1016 Mining Corporation. After that contract, we did a historical review of Alabama's gold district, looking at the archives and whatever else we could locate. In that review, we learned that the 1830 gold rush discovery that started Alabama's gold rush was made in a small creek that ties into Chestnut Creek, located in what was Otago County. Yes, sir. Now, the Roser Project's northern border is Chestnut Creek for about a mile and a quarter. Yes, sir. And at one time, that was located in Otago County. In Otago County until the lines were re redrawn. Now, there's only was there was only eight miles of Chestnut Creek located in Otago County at Correct. that time. The small creek that matched the description of this first Discovery was located on the Roser Project. Yes, sir. Very near the mouth of that creek is two mining tunnels that on, we found. On both sides of the creek. Uh, the location of an open pit mine. Yes, sir. 
and the ruins of what was a processing plant, which was a major plus processing yeah, plant back in really the 1800s. Cool. It was a stamp mill. And up the creek, about 60 feet more in elevation. They dammed it up and they had a water pipe to, to run the, the stamp mill. From a historical review, we learned that the Roser site is the location of the discovery that started Alabama's 1830 gold rush. Yes, sir. That's pretty cool. Dusty, it was your prospecting skills that located and decided on this project out of all that we reviewed. Dad, we couldn't have located these ruins if it wasn't for Steve and Susan's help because it was in a jungle. I didn't, I didn't know, know where it was. Yeah, it was quite grown up. You know, on that pit mine, there was even a slide where the, they just slid the ore down the bank straight to the plant. Yes, sir. That was pretty cool. No. We did a lot of test hole work, assaying samples from each hole. We had these samples verified with Gary Smith taking his own samples from various of these holes. Correct. We hired an engineer to map the work. Yep. At the end of the day, we located an ore body containing how many tons? 3,095,000 tons. Dusty, what is the average assay value of these 3 million tons? Most of these assays are the complex precious metals. It is 6.36 ounces of gold per ton, 4.27 ounces of platinum per ton, 2.83 ounces of rhodium per ton, and 1.91 ounces of palladium per ton. Okay, that was a good point. Now, these are very high assays. Yes, sir. But a lot of that's the complex precious metals. Correct. At today's precious metal prices, August the 28th, uh, 2018, the ore value is a little over $19,000 per ton. That would mean that the assay value of the project is over $58 billion. That's a lot. A lot of people get excited about that number, but is the Roser project worth $58 billion? No, sir. Not without a process. Well, that's what Bob told us. We had to have a process to harvest these metals before the project's going to be worth anything. Correct. Okay. What were they harvesting in the 1800s? The free gold and the free silver. To prove the Rosa project, you and I targeted the free gold and silver, which we knew could be harvested, and then we went after the complex gold. Some of the consultants involved with various of their lab studies have had some success harvesting platinum and rhodium, but that is not our first focus. No. In this next picture, a video clip, you're seeing Gary Smith of Advanced Analytical, and he's showing us two small pieces of metal. Now, the first is gold, and the second is platinum. That was a major accomplishment. Yes, sir, it was. A major one. It cost us a lot of money to get yes, to that sir, point. Yes, Our first ore development work was done by others in their labs. As of 2010, we staffed and operated our own labs, so our first in Alabama and then in Mexico. Yes. How many professionals have been involved in our work? Uh, it's over 50. How many of these have had success harvesting precious metals from the Roser Project? 27. So we've advanced past that first metal that was harvested. Yes, sir, we have. It was a major accomplishment, yes, but we've gone way past it. Okay, can we take the lab results obtained from these 27 consultants and come up with a value for the Rosa project? No, sir, not yet. We have to have a, a pilot plant work study on it. Many times, lab processes use pretreatments and processes that only can be used in a controlled environment of a laboratory. Sometimes the pretreatments and various processes are costly which is not so much a factor whenever you're in a lab a setting using small samples, just a few grams, but it becomes a major factor when you're in a processing operation using, you know, processing okay. many, many tons. So the purpose of a lab extraction work is to learn about the ore and what it takes to harvest the reported values. Yes. After the lab, we take what is learned and locate the right 
processing circuit to harvest as much of the precious metals as possible in a plant setting. This work is done in a pilot plant. Correct. This is very costly yes, work. Sir. It's time consuming. And because of this, many skip want to it. skip the step. Yeah. Generally, those that do fail. From the learned data in a pilot plant setting, you can properly establish the cost of the plant, the cost of operation, and the yield per ton. Now, add to that the current market prices of the recovered metal, and you can establish the value of your project. Yes, sir. As an example, the assay value of the Rosa project is over $58 billion. Yes. The current lab extraction value of that project could be around $10 billion, depending on which slab process we use. Correct. The profits that we estimate can be earned based on pilot plant work are around $750 million. $750 million, that is a big number for this project. That's very good news for the Rosers. Yes. It's good news for whoever's involved in the project. However, with some breakthroughs that we've had of late, that number could substantially increase taking another bite out of that $58 billion apple. Yes, sir. Our intention is to keep biting at that apple until we're satisfied. Now, I'll add that these numbers are based on harvesting gold, silver, and graphite at today's spot prices. Our main cash product here is gold. When we started on the Rosa project, we knew the values were in the ore, we just did not know how to harvest those yes. values. Now, after a lot of effort, time, and money, we have the technology to harvest a major profit from this project. Here's the best part of that. The same technology can be used on hundreds of other projects located within Alabama's Gold District. Yes, sir. I have a question. How can we help Alabama property owners? who have precious metals on their properties, and they're unaware of it. Well, education and good training designed to develop needed skills. Our background is in the construction business, and we learned the technology and skill needed. Yes. We can teach what we learn to others. Our plan is to finish our work, demonstrate that work on the Rosa Project, and then train, license, and equip businessmen and women with our technology and equipment, and let them help these Alabama property owners with fat royalty payments. Yes, sir. We are working to design inexpensive plants, relative speaking, Amen. that are able to harvest millions in profits per year each year. We will support the team and provide key services such as refining and whatever else is needed, and our success will be measured in how many people we help succeed. Yes, sir. Dad, before we close, can you tell them about Spin on Top and how that relates to Alabama? In 1901, Anthony F. Lucas drilled an oil well to the depth of 1,139 feet in Beaumont, Texas, and brought in a major gusher, and the name of this well was Spin on Top. Some say Spindletop changed the oil industry forever wow. and established Texas as the oil capital of the world. Dusty, it wasn't Spindletop that accomplished this. It was the new technology employed that allowed for the successful drilling of the well to this depth through some rocky and sandy materials. What most don't know is that others drilled in Spindletop area before Lucas. They knew that there was oil within this field. The problem was nobody could drill deep enough. they get to about 800 feet, and the well's walls would collapse and seize the drill around that depth, and they couldn't go deeper. Right. Now, the key to Lucas's victory was the drillers he hired. They were very skilled, and the drilling secret passed on to them. When their drill pipes were showing signs of seizing up, one of these drillers saw some cows, and he had what I call a God-inspired idea. Mm -hmm. Now, acting on the idea, he ran these cows back and forth through a pond. Now, this was a pond that stored their processing water. With this action, he created mud. And instead of pumping water into the well to cool the drill and shore up the well's walls, he pumped in what became known as drilling mud. 
it was the discovery of drilling mud that enabled Lucas's drillers to push past 800 feet wow. to the depth of 1,139 feet. Dusty, it was this new and simple technology that changed Texas and created some very wealthy people in, the, yes, in that state and within the world. Without the drilling mud, there would not have been a spindle top, and Texas would be a very different place today. It's Alabama's turn now, and the Rosa Project is Alabama's spindle top. Yes, sir.